Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. And it's episode 7, and after taking you to the moon in the last episode, this time we're going to stay on Earth, where we'll wander through the stacks of the world's largest library, and possibly the deepest one. This is a slightly longer episode, so rather than go on about supporting the book owl with your hard-earned cash, I'm just going to ask you to show your support by making sure you hit the subscribe button on your favorite listening app, or by sharing the podcast with just one other person. And once again, I have to give a big thank you to Tierney of TierneyCreates.com and to Helen of CrawCraftsBeasties.com for mentioning the show on their blogs again over the past few weeks. So thanks, guys. All right, grab your library cards and your book bag and your passports if you're outside the UK because it's time to head to the British Library. So, remember at the start of the show how I said this was the world's largest library? Well, I kind of lied. Square footage-wise, it may not be, but it is the largest by collection. And I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers in this episode, but this is going to be a very, wow, that's a lot kind of episode. So, bear with me, I won't just number dump on you, but I am going to be spouting some digits. As for the collection, well... It's hard to pinpoint, but estimates put it at 170 to 200 million items. And that includes historical artifacts, uh, sound recordings, various other types of media such as journals and magazines, and some 13 million books. And I'll let you book nerds drool over that number for a second. To put the collection into perspective, Time Out Magazine has calculated that If you'd looked at just five items a day, every day, for the rest of your life, well, okay, you would have to have a very long life because it would take you 8,000 years to see everything. Now, I don't know about you, but I tend to view way more than just five items whenever I go to the library, so I bet I could knock that number down to 2,000 years, no problem. But as we'll find out, it's not going to be easy to see the entire collection because it's growing by leaps and bounds every single day. I'll get to some more numbers in a bit, but right now, let's travel back a few years and explore the history of the library. And we'll also talk a little bit about what makes the library special today, even for people who don't live anywhere near the library. So as I'm recording this, I've just turned the calendar page to July. And that's the reason I chose this topic for this episode, because the British Library was founded in July 1973. Now, of course, the concept of libraries in England dates back centuries, but these were mostly private libraries whose owners allowed people to make use of their collections and could be pretty restrictive, as you can imagine, in such a stratified society. It wouldn't be until the 1850s when a truly public library would open. But that is a whole different topic, and I have tried to start an episode about the history of libraries, but it was just too immense, so I'm going to stay away from that for right now. So let's put on the brakes and turn the car back to the founding of the British Library. Prior to 1973, the library had it had simply been a part of the British Museum since around the mid-1700s, and it was housed in what's called the Reading Room of the British Museum, which, if you've ever been to or have seen pictures of the main lobby of the British Museum, the Reading Room is that big, round, domed room above the, the central gift shops. And I'll add a picture of that to the episode webpage, so you can see what I'm talking about if you're not quite sure what I mean. And you know the routine. Any link mentioned in the show will be included in the show notes, so don't worry about trying to find a pen and pencil or anything. Anyway, it kind of made sense that the library would be part of the museum because some of the items, which were mostly acquired by donations, were hundreds and even thousands of years old. These donated items included the entirety of George II's Old Royal Library and George III's King's Library. And George III, by the way, is the one who happened to lose those pesky American colonies. So the library 
held lots of old stuff, kind of like what you'd find in a museum, right? But the collection wasn't just in the British Museum. It was spread out in a mishmash of items to various buildings across London. Then in 1972, along came the UK's Library Act, which made the collection its own entity. And by July 1973, the actual British Library was officially founded. The trouble was there was no actual library building for the collection to go to. And so the British Library remained in the British Museum for nearly 25 more years. Talk about the slow pace of government, right? So after a lot of head scratching and probably a bunch of committees, the first idea to get the library collection its own home wasn't the best. Okay, I'm just going to say that. So the British Museum is located in the Bloomsbury area of London. And the first idea was to basically level the blocks of buildings in front of the British Museum to make way for the library. And if you're unfamiliar with London, the Bloomsbury area isn't some derelict neighborhood with rundown structures that are half toppling over and in need of demolition anyway. These buildings, some of them historic, are still used by scientific and literary societies, businesses, and residents. So, as you can guess, this did not go over well. And after much protesting led most strongly by George Wagner, the planning committee went back to the think tank. Eventually, wiser heads prevailed, and they settled on a disused area near St. Pancras Station. And in the late 1980s, designing and building began. The architect who won the job was... Prepare for a very long British name here, okay? (laughs) His name was Sir Colin Alexander St. John Wilson. And he thankfully shortened his name to a nickname of just Sandy. So Sandy designed a place with a brick facade that fit in perfectly with the red brick of St. Pancras Station. And speaking of red bricks, it's time for some numbers. About 10 million bricks went into creating what would be the largest public building built in the UK in the 20th century. Of course, not all those bricks went into the actual building itself. Some were used to build the library's entry piazza, where a very, very, very large statue of Isaac Newton hangs out with a few other sculptures. So with a building and a piazza in place, in 1997, it was finally time to start bringing the collection to its new home. Trucks began trundling between the British Museum and the British Library in October 1997. And trundling. And trundling. In June 1998, Queen Elizabeth got out her big old pair of scissors and cut the ribbon to officially open the doors, but it would take four years to get the entire collection over into the new building. And just as a side note, the reading room at the British Museum is still open, but it's primarily used as a research library. Okay, so the Queen has cut the ribbon and you've wandered in. The first thing that's probably going to draw your eyes, besides the wide open interior, is probably going to be a central six-story tower of smoky glass, behind which are thousands of items. So what's in there? Well, remember George III's donations? That's what's inside. The contents of the King's Library include 65,000 books and 19,000 other items, including things like maps and pamphlets. And that smoky glass isn't there just for decoration. It helps protect these antique items from UV light while still allowing you to gape at the tower of book spines. Within the library itself, if you could wander every area of the stacks, you would walk past over 256 kilometers of shelving, which is about 150 miles. But you might have trouble ever reaching the end because another... Eight to nine kilometers or five miles of new shelf space is added every year. Okay, so why do they need to keep adding all this new shelf space? Well, because the British Library is what's called a legal deposit. And no, that doesn't mean that's where legal documents go to die. It's actually a concept that dates back to 1610 and was made official in the Copyright Act of 1911. What it basically means is that the library gets a copy of every single book published in the UK and Ireland. And so I got a little curious about that um, because one source said that 
that meant that the library added 8,000 new items every single day, which seemed a little extreme. My own local library only adds about 10,000 items every year. So I did a little research and I found the library's annual statement for 2018. And in that year, through the legal deposit, they added about 300,000 new physical items and 250,000 digital ones, which works out to be about 1,500 items being added each day, which is still a lot. And it's still going to add to those 8,000 years if you're trying to look at every single item. So I'm glad I checked. So even though what you see of the British Library is pretty big, it's kind of like an iceberg where you see only a small bit sticking up from the surface. I told you at the beginning that this was the deepest library, right? Well, that time I wasn't lying because this place goes down eight stories below ground. This underground area is environmentally controlled with movable, color-coded stacks of shelves. And what happens is if you want an item from there, you put in a request, a printout goes to an assistant who goes and hunts down your item, they put it in a little box, and then it travels along a portion of the 1.6 kilometers of conveyor belts to get to the pickup desk. And for my newsletter subscribers, among a couple other special bonuses, I'm going to have a video that allows you to ride along the rails with one of the items. When you're done with your book or whatever item you've requested, it goes back along the conveyor belt and an assistant collects it and reshelves it. On average, these poor assistants pull 3,000 items a day, which makes my legs tired thinking of how many miles they must walk. Okay, so the library has miles and miles of shelves and, you know, loads and loads of books. But it's just really a big library, right? What's so great about it? Well, what makes it special is that the library's collection houses some astounding treasures that you can see for free. As I said, the library has been collecting donations of materials for a couple hundred years now, long before they were ever actually a library. So they've gotten some amazing manuscripts, documents, and other historically important printed items, which are put on display in the Sir John Ritblatt Gallery within the, mu within the library. And this is honestly a book nerd and history nerd paradise. Now, what's on display there does rotate to help preserve the items from too much light exposure. But what you might see are things like, and keep in mind, these are all originals. You might see Captain Cook's journals, song lyrics and letters from the Beatles, and no, those aren't from the 200-year-old donations. There's also decrees and letters signed by the Queen Elizabeth I, and if you've ever seen her signature on a book cover, it really does have all those flourishes and fancy swashes and everything, and it really is quite a signature. They also have two of the remaining copies of the Magna Carta from the year 1215, which if you don't know what the Magna Carta is, that basically limited the powers of the king and kind of would eventually inspire later constitutions written by the UK and the US and other countries. And they also have, very cool, the sole surviving copy of Beowulf. So all in all, even if you have no intention of looking at the books in the library's collection, just going to that gallery is well worth making your way over to the building if you're ever in London. But, of course, right now, most of us can't travel or aren't willing to travel. But you can still visit the British Library. And I'm going to tell you about a few things, and I'll have links to all of them. But if you go to the library's website, you'll discover they have some unbelievable online resources. One of these is a sound library where you can listen to British accents from across the island. You can also click your way through several online exhibits, including the history of writing, the history of magic, and the history of map making. But probably the resource I could see myself losing the most time playing with is their collection of digitized manuscripts, where you can flip through the pages of several famous manuscripts. One of these is the St. Cuthbert Gospels, which if you've heard of the Book of Kells, which will be a topic on the podcast one day, I promise, you'll be familiar with um, what an illuminated manuscript is. And if you're not familiar, it's a book, usually a Bible, on which pages are decorated with brightly colored animals and intricate patterns. 
And even though the Book of Kells is probably the most famous of these, the St. Cuthbert Gospels are actually about 80 years older than the Book of Kells. And thanks to the British Library, you can virtually turn it page by page looking at these amazing drawings. You can also browse the pages of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks from the early 1500s, where you can try to read his backwards writing, look at his prototype helicopter, and ponder his, you know, his many sketches. If I'm remembering right, I think the library's website said they had 30,000 images of their various manuscripts digitized. So that should keep you busy for a while. And maybe by then we'll be through the pandemic and the travel bans will all be over and you can go visit the books in person. Right? Wishful thinking? All right. So that's it for the British Library, or at least that's all I'm going to cover. It really does have some incredible displays, so when they reopen, if you can go, I highly encourage you to do so. In the meantime, enjoy those online resources. All right, thank you everyone for listening, and remember to subscribe and review. If you want to keep listening, I've got a couple updates coming up. The first update is a bit of podcast news. I've been working on updating my old episodes, and I know this is only episode 7, but I want to get this taken care of before things get out of hand. See, I am, I'm constantly trying to improve the sound quality of this podcast because I I don't have like a studio and I don't have like the world's best mic or anything. But um, there are a few of the earlier episodes that had some horrible, horrible sound quality issues. And now that I've got a little better handle on my editing software, I'm trying to fix those. I've just taken care of episode three. So if you tried to listen to that before and just couldn't get through it because it sounded so terrible, maybe give it another try because it should be a little better. I'll keep you updated with other improvements um, as I get through these episodes. And I am constantly, as I said, I'm constantly working on the sound quality of my recordings. But if you've noticed a sound issue, don't be afraid to let me know by using the contact information in the show notes or by going to thebookowlpodcast.com slash contact. As for my writing updates, well, it's July and that means I've jumped back into my Cassie Black trilogy with both feet. I'm working on book one, which was a bit of a decision process because I had been originally thinking about getting books two and three complete, or, well, mostly complete before going back to book one. But since book one is so close to being done, I think I want to get through that and really hone that puppy to perfection so I can get it out of my head and get it organized for some promotional stuff. In June, I also wrote a short story, and I'll be polishing that up this month as well. Okay, everyone, that is it for the show. Thank you so much for listening, and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod.